Luxo Jr. was created the first year that Pixar um, became a separate company from Lucasfilm in 1986. Um, Ed Catmull, who's president of Pixar, came to me and said, John, let's do a film for SIGGRAPH. And at the time, I was learning modeling from Bill Reeves, who I was working with, how to create the models themselves. At the time, I was really doing all it, just the animation. And I was taking the example of, of a desk lamp that was on my, um, on my desk um, at the time. And so I, I was measuring it and modeling it. And you know, I thought, oh, this is a nice geometric shape I can model. But then, when, then I started thinking about moving it around and giving it a life. You know, and it was really like, oh, this is kind of fun, you know, just trying to keep it looking like a real lamp but giving it life. How would a lamp move if it was alive, I asked myself. And then um, one of the guys brought in his, his baby, who was, um, I think, about six months old at the time. And I thought that baby was great. I wasn't married at the time. I had children. And, and I was amazed that, that the scale of, of babies compared to he, adults was really, like, you know, was quite different. And something you do as an animator, you're always observing. And I noticed that their little hands could barely touch the top of their head. You know, it was really funny. So I went back to working on this lamp, and I thought, what would, what would a baby lamp look like? So I started scaling different parts of the, uh, of the model differently. And so if you compare the, the, the parent and the, the baby lamp, you notice that the, shades, the shade on the baby is a little smaller. The rods are the same thickness, but they're just really short. And so I just scaled it to give it kind of a baby look. And then the, the story just kind of evolved. You know? And then I just had a little incident of them playing with a ball together. You know? But, but again, in the movement, it was all character animation. You know, there's no dialogue, there's no faces, but it's clear that one's a parent and one's, you know, one's an adult and one's a baby. You know, it's the way they move. You know, it's doing the same action, only it's clearly they do it differently with different speeds and different intensities and all. And so it was really exciting because um, it was also a, a when the film came out, it premiered at SIGGRAPH in 1986, it got a tremendous. Um, ovation because it was so different from anything that had been done in computer graphics because at that time they were the cameras people were flying the camera through environments right and left you know it's because one of the things you can do with computer graphics is you can take and you can fly from a million miles away all the way down through the eye of a needle on earth you know it is it's it's something you can do well with luxo jr we locked the camera down and and we had no background it was just a wood floor that fades off into black so that the audience would focus on the characters, you know. Also, we, we locked the camera down and had no background because we couldn't, uh, Bill Reeves told me, John, you can't move the camera. We can't finish rendering it in time if you move the camera. So I locked the camera down. But I'm glad I did now because I could say in, in tremendous, you know, the intelligence I had and foresight that it was, would be different than everything else it was done. But it, it, uh, it's really, what happened is it caused everybody to focus just on the characters. The next project we did was Red's Dream. And just after SIGGRAPH was over and we got uh, in with Luxo Jr., we, um, we immediately everybody said, what are you going to do next? And I was like, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? And I had, a, all, um, I had started thinking about this little um, unicycle character and in a circus and, you know, to where at first, you think it's this clown is doing everything, but it turns out to be actually the unicycle that is, you know, the, the talented one. And so it evolved, and Bill Reeves, meanwhile, had been doing some beautiful um, imagery of like a city at night in the rain. It's something we had talked about doing, some dark, moody um, computer graphics. And so I saw the work he was doing, and it was like, I know, we'll take his imagery of the city and make it dark and moody, and then you see a bike shop, and you go into the bike shop, and you see leaned over in the corner, in, in, in the, the clearance corner, where all the, the, the half-price bikes are, is a little unicycle. And then you go, in, you go into his seat, and it becomes, and then this little circus piece I was working on becomes the dream of him becoming the star of a circus. And then you pull out, and you realize that it's just a dream. And so that was the essence of of Red's dream. And I wanted the ending to be kind of poignant and sad. Um, and everybody was saying, no, no, you got to have a happy ending. 
have the clown come into the shop or something. Make it happy. And then, no. And I said, no, no, no. I want it to be, you know, I want it to be sad. It's, it's what we call um, Pixar's blue period. You know, it's kind of dark. It, it, uh, they love it in Europe, you know. At Pixar, we, we're, the way that, that we work is, is rather unique, I believe. And that is to where we have traditionally trained artists working very hand in hand, very closely with um, with uh, the with the technicians, with the computer scientists, with the people who, who are inventing this stuff, and it's a colla this collaboration that I think what's what is what makes our work really unique. Um, it's because basically it's because the way I work with Bill Reeves and Evan Osby, the two guys I've worked with most closely, they're absolutely brilliant. They've invented a lot of stuff in computer graphics. And it's like, for me to understand everything that they know, I mean, Bill is a PhD. He's a doctor of computer science. It took him years to, to, figure, to learn all that he knows. So uh, there's no way that I can know what he knows. Conversely, you know, it would be impossible for him to, uh, to go through all the training that I did as an animator to know how to make something come alive by moving it. And so this is where the collaboration works, because I sit there, I look at something he does, like a particle system, or this a new keyframe system, or some object that is real stretchy. And I'm like, wow, that's great. And immediately it starts my creative thoughts going. And I turn in and I start like creating you know, some character that uses that. Um, in Tin Toy, um, it was kind of the other way around. It was, it was saying like, Let's do a baby. Let's do, you know, I, I got very inspired um, from some home video that my sister took of my nephew because of the way that he was uh, seven months old and the way he was playing with his toys. I thought this was great. Meanwhile, Bill Rees had a baby. His daughter was born at that same year. And so he was completely hooked on babies. So it, let's do something with a baby. And so it came up with a, the idea from looking at this videotape of, of my nephew playing with his toys, of like, just, just animate a baby playing with toys, but tell the story from the toy's point of view. That's the twist, you know? Everything, every film that we make at Pixar, I try to make it so that it is based on something that people are familiar with, but you make the audience look at it from a slightly different point of view, and that's where sort of the interest comes. And so therefore, this baby in Tin Toy you know, the goal was to try to animate it so it had kind of very, you know, baby kind of movement to it. But when you think about being a toy in the mouth of a, you know, with all this slobber and stuff, it's horrific. It becomes a monster. So in some sense, it became kind of a, a horror film. Luxo Jr. was nominated for an Academy Award after it came out. And that was very exciting because that was the first time 3D computer animation had ever been, had ever come close to to winning any any um, major film awards, and it was really exciting. It didn't win, but with Tin Toy, um, we got nominated again. And this time, after being <gasps> getting excited and like uh, the, they open the envelope, oh, and it's like we didn't win. So this time, I learned I wasn't going to get all excited because there was another uh, Canadian animated film at the same year that was fantastic. Um, that I knew would win the Oscar. I just knew it. It was made by a friend of mine, and I knew it would win the Oscar. So when they opened the envelope, oh, speaking of, here, see? They opened the envelope, and it said, the Oscar goes to, can you see that? The Oscar goes to Tin Toy, John Lasseter, and William Lee. This is the actual envelope. Um, they, did you get that okay? Um, it was thrilling. And it was really exciting. And the whole, um, how it's affected the company has been phenomenal because I think that, that all of a sudden, um, you know, that little gold statue in Hollywood really means a lot. You know, it, 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 for some reason, it, it just, you know, Hollywood puts a lot of weight on that. And kind of because of that, we were taken a lot more seriously as filmmakers. Not really in the commercial world. I mean, there's, as a production company making commercials, we were able to keep doing, doing things. Whereas in, um, in Hollywood, all of a sudden, you won an Oscar. You're a filmmaker, you know. So I think it, it's helped us. Also, it's just been, you know, really fun to, uh, to hand it to people. To, uh, to, have you ever held an Oscar? No. 
you can hold it after the interview. In the production of Tin Toy, every single piece of software was brand new. So it was extremely difficult. The, an the modeling software, the animation software, the rendering software. It was also twice as long in as any film we did. It was just, and we were doing a baby, which, you know, organic shape that we had never done before. So it was very difficult. So when it came time to do our next film, we said, let's just do something that's easy to do in the computer. Let's do something that's really made like Andre and Wally, was made in geometric shapes and just simple. And so my wife has got quite a collection of the little, you know, snowballs, the snow shakers, the uh, little souvenirs. And so I started thinking about a story that, that um, with a little snowman that was kind of trapped in it. And the story happened very, very quickly. We kind of came up with a story, designed it to be very simple. And it was, it was really um, a very easy production to do. Um, but it was done in 3D. It was one of, it's because one of the things that we love to do here is to really try to show off the fact that, that within the computer, our, the worlds that we create are truly three-dimensional worlds. I mean, you can move in and around objects, you know? And, and like when you see it on videotape, it's only a two-dimensional view of that. And so we, we produced it in 3D, and it's really great because it, it's, it, you can see all the dimensions of it. But, but one of the things that I went to um, Bill and Eben, and again, it's this like art drives technology, technology inspires art. This is the, what happens at Pixar. Because I went to them and said, you know, we're doing this, this film with this little snowman. We have to figure out a way to do the swirling snow. If we can't do that, tell me now, we'll do a different story. It's that important. And so Evan thought about it and said, yeah, I know, I think I can come up with a way. So it, it works great because it's a real cheat, but it really feels like the snow is swirling, you know, in, in that. So it was really quite exciting. And so after every film I made, I got a call from the people at Disney saying, hey, John, why don't you come back to work with us and stuff. So finally, after, after we won the Oscar, of course, they turned up the heat really high because, oh, my God, he won an Oscar, you know. And so, and so finally, we said, why don't we, you know, why can't we do a film for you but only have us do it here at Pixar, a feature film? And they thought at the time, no, 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 no. All, all Disney films are done by Disney. But then they, I think they thought about it, and there was some other things that happened that all of a sudden they came to us and said, you know, because we, we've done some software for them, and so they, they have a good relationship with Pixar. And so they finally came to us and said, okay, you know, pitch us some stories. We're interested in you guys doing a film for us. And so we came up with some stories and pitched them an idea, and they, they really liked the story that we pitched to them. And so we, we, we got into a deal. So now we're in the middle of production on, it should be the first um, 3D computer animated feature film. So the whole thing is being produced here at Pixar. Um, the difference in directing a, um, a feature film than it is work, uh, doing these short films is that I'm a lot busier. You know, I have a lot more meetings. In fact, here's my little meeting card for the next day. You know, it's um, the other the other thing, which it, I guess is is maybe good, maybe bad. I don't know. But I I don't. On all the short films, I get to do the animation. I direct it, but I also get to do the animation. But on a feature film as a director, you're so busy that you don't actually get to sit down and do the animation. And that's sort of sad for me, because I, I love doing animation. It's one of the things I, I get the most enjoyment out of. But I plan to take a computer home. Now the computers are small enough to where I could take one home, and I'll probably do some. After I put my children to bed, then I'll sit up and create my animation and try to get a few scenes in the film that are mine. But the film's going to be 75 minutes long, and we, we're, it's um, taking two and a half years to produce. So it should be out in Americans in summer of 95, roughly. When you win an Oscar, the Academy gives you a whole catalog of, of outfits you can buy for the. It has um, really nice um, tuxedo. It has um, a formal wedding dress for the women who win the Oscars. Um, and the bathrobe is exquisite. It's this really rich terry cloth. So it's quite fun. So I, I, I got the, the, uh, the fatigues, you know, the army outfit. I thought that was kind of nice. You see, the Oscar's kind of alone. And I have the tuxedo at home, but now I want to get the, the wedding dress. So I need another Oscar. You know, when people who win multiple Oscars, that's the real reason. It's so that they can dress them up. Right.